And now, for the last session on the live stage here at World City, we look forward into the future to ask what's next for World Cities. To do so, Chris Fair is joined by urbanist and author Greg Clark to wrap up World City 2023 by looking towards 2024 and beyond. Greg works with investors, businesses, governments, and cities to help navigate this compelling century, inspiring new collaborations and forging new futures. All right. So here we are, last session. Here we are. We did this again, uh, we did this a year ago, so here we are again for this. This, for those of you that don't know that are here in person and maybe haven't seen some of the virtual sessions that have been going on, Greg did three sessions over yesterday talking to city leaders in Bogota, in Sydney, in Barcelona. Um, so this is a moment where our virtual world mm -hmm. and you as our roving reporter and our physical conference hopefully come together in a digital kind of way. So tell me a little bit about the conversations you had. I saw some of the interviews with the mayor in Bogota, which I thought was fantastic. But what were you hearing from these city leaders as they thought about the future of their city? Yeah, Chris, well, let me just say, firstly, it's great to be here again. And thank you for the invitation. So what did the three leaders tell me? Well, Eamon Waterford, the chief executive of the committee for Sydney, basically said Sydney's at a kind of crossroads. It doesn't know whether it's trying to follow a North American model of responding to the pandemic, which we'll come back to, I'm sure, in a minute, or whether it's trying to do something different. And in particular, Sydney is a you know, hugely successful city, a massive destination, a growing population. The government has just opened, as it were, the gates for more migration. But Sydney has a very acute housing affordability challenge. So Eamon talked to us in great detail about what they're going to do about housing affordability. And if you haven't seen that interview, that's worth seeing. And then Barbara Ponsgeiner, who is the commissioner for the 2030 agenda in Barcelona, which is essentially the way in which Barcelona takes the sustainable development goals and translates them into a local and metropolitan strategy for the city. And she spoke in great detail about the green economy, the blue economy, the livable lifestyle, and she also raised the issue, very interestingly, of the backlash against the super blocks, the 15-minute city, the, the pedestrianization and all of that. And she started to get into some of those areas of conflict, which I think is what we're going to talk about a little bit now, and where does all that go? And then Mayor Claudia Lopez, who's coming to the end of her four-year term in Bogota, has done so many interesting things. She's introduced Metropolitan Transit Authority. She's written a Metropolitan Plan, and she's created a Metropolitan Governance. But she's also done a huge amount around the welfare of citizens. And she tells an amazing story in the, in to, in the interview about a young woman growing up in Bogota today and how her experience is going to be different to what it would have been 20 years ago and how the experience of her mother is going to be different as well. So it was absolutely fascinating. And in a way, Chris, it built upon things that you and I discussed last year, the, the emergence of a new social contract for cities following the pandemic, the idea of the switch from the focus on cons consumers, corporates, and commuters towards habitat, innovation, and experience in our cities, and a big focus, I think, on in a sense, creating a new model for what a world city is. Right. Well, we'll come back to when we're talking about some of those regional variations and what does urbanization mean sure. uh, you know, in, in a moment. But I wanted to also then talk a little bit about London, yeah. where you're from. And we released our rankings, and London talked yeah. about the rankings again. You've done a number Thank of you. papers about, <laughs> about London. Uh, you know, what's your perspective on what a future of London looks like, and why is London uh, the top of our rankings? Yeah, and you know, um, you never talk about London when you're in New York if you'd want to stay for long. But um, you know, uh, I've spent much of this year writing six essays about the future of London for a group called New London Architecture, which is not a completely different group to the group of people we've got in the room here. It's architects, urban designers, real estate investors, operators, city planners, and all their friends, right? And it's a group of 500 organizations committed to thinking about the future of London. And so if you like, 
The first proposition is that given what we're going to talk about in terms of global urbanization, it makes sense to think of our leading cities as kind of laboratories of urban knowledge and expertise for other cities. If you like, the question is not what's the competition, but aren't all of these competitors now customers for our knowledge and our innovations and everything else? So we have this idea of London as a pioneer of a new kind of world city, and we'll, we'll come on to what that is. And then um, the other essays have focused on things like the re-engineering of the city center post-pandemic, a big conversation about how do we reinvent Friday, and the relationship between, as it were, so many people making choices about how they work, when they travel, where and how they consume, and where they live as a consequence of those other choices, do we now move to a city that, in a sense, embraces a three-day weekend? What is Friday? And we've had a brilliant conversation about the reinvention of Friday. Um, we've also been doing this work about the future of the, the wider region of London, which I've called remixing the metropolis, which is all about how the town centers and the, what you might call the suburban areas, some people in the room will know London well, some don't, but just like New York has a region, you know, the, the tri-state region of New York, we have a massive region around London. And how that reinvents itself, how we get that densification, how we pick up some of the things that Lev and Greg were talking about earlier, um, that's really alive and well there. And then we've done uh, quite a big piece of thinking about London and the planet and climate. And London, as you probably know, has been trying to really innovate on air quality issues. So not only have we had congestion charging for 23 years now, and we've had a low emission zone, an ultra low emission zone, we're now, we now have London-wide congestion charging, which is all around air quality, and it's focused very much on that. And then the last piece that we're working on now is a kind of compact, if you like, between everybody who works in the built environment profession and the future of the city, really making the point that it's the built environment, it's space, it's place, it's buildings and everything else that has to lead the agenda for what the city will look like in the future because almost everybody else is a client of the city, but the people in the built environment are, in a sense, the founders, the owners, and the stewards of the city. So it's putting the built environment at the heart of the conversation about where the city goes next. And that will be published uh, very early next year. It'll be called The New London Agenda. And I'm sure it will be something we should talk about next year at World City. Right. So I, yesterday, I talked a little bit about, in our opening remarks, around sort of a tale of two cities. You know, most of our work at Resonance and our rankings are really focused on cities that are in advanced economies, part of the global north, yeah. and you sort of have this other half in the global south, but I think it's probably more complicated than that in terms yeah. of the types of urbanism. Um, you've been at four different conferences. You were at the World Cities yeah. Summit last week with 47 yeah. different mayors. Yeah. Kind of give me your frame a little bit on the different types of urbanization you're seeing happening around the world. I think we probably both agree it's definitely not a one-size-fits-all oh, sure. approach, yeah, yeah. Um, and there's probably more layers to it than, than even yeah. I talked about yesterday. And I brought some numbers with me, too, because I thought you'd want some accuracy here. So, um, so I have been very lucky. In the last six months, I've been to the Brussels Urban Summit, 300 mayors. I've been to the World City Summit with 50 mayors. I went to the Asia Pacific City Summit where there were 70 mayors. And I've been to a whole, oh, the Euro City Summit too. So I think I've met about 600 mayors in the last six months talking about cities and everything else. And I guess the, the first thing I would say is that nearly everybody is capturing this idea of we're in a new cycle of reinventing world cities. We're in the cycle of urban innovation, uh, as it says here. And there's an opportunity to remake our cities and to break out of old, stale patterns in a way that we couldn't do before. And there's a series of topics about how we do that. One is about inclusion and participation and inequality. Another one, of course, is about climate and resilience and circularity. And almost everybody in the room will be able to guess the agendas, because the agendas are the same. But as you say, Chris, that the contexts are really very different. And um, the way I like to frame this is to talk about the century of the city. So just to do this very quickly, if you start with 1980, which is a useful date, and you go to 2080, and you think about the world and how it's changing, then in 1980, 
40% of the world's population lived in cities. In 2080, it's 80%. So it's a, a doubling of the percentage. In 1980, 2.3 billion people lived in cities. In 2080, it will be 9.3 billion. So it's a multiplication by four of the number of people living in cities. And then in 1980, we had about 275 cities of more than 1 million. And by 2080, we'll have 1,600. It's a multiplication by six. And the pandemic has not changed any of that, right? That, those numbers are still going. So where we are is in a situation where other parts of the world are in this rapid, rapid urbanization phase. And so just to give you the data, so 1980, 2080, China, 20% to 90%. ASEAN, that's Southeast Asia, 25% to 85%. Africa, 27% to 80%. The Middle East, 49% to 95%. India, 22% to 62%. Latin America, 65 to 95. Europe, 69 to 89. Northeast Asia, 70 to 72. North America, 74 to 90. And Oceania, Australia, New Zealand, 71 to 80%. So when you think about that, what it means is that Different parts of the world are accelerating this path of urbanization in different ways. And maybe we can think of the world in three groups. I'll do this very quickly. So I think there's a group that we might say are at peak urbanization. And you would put into that group Europe, North America, perhaps Latin America, and certainly Northeast Asia. And in that group, what you're seeing is the pandemic and the changes and the adoption of technology and these new working practices are having a broadly similar effect in all of them, except North America is an outlier. So what's happening in the USA and Canada, as always, is a much more rapid adoption of technology, a much stronger focus on labor mobility and people movements. And you know the, all of the stats, don't you? People who live in the US are much more likely to move home than people who live in Europe. And they're more likely to do it four or five times in their lifetime. People who live in Europe might do it once or twice. People who live in Japan will only do it once. So even though you've got this group of advanced economies, the former, you know, the, the, the first industrial nations, What's happening in North America in terms of population change, technology adoption, hybrid working, remote working, is much more pronounced. So just to give you the example, in, in Europe, we're back to sort of 85% ridership on public transport. We're back to 80, 85% people in offices. Friday is still a quiet day, but Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday are back, and there's been a big leisure and entertainment-led recovery. People are going back to European cities to eat, to drink, to go to culture, to, to be in the mood, you know, and everything else, in a way that doesn't seem to chime with what's happening in North America. So we've, we've got that group. There's another group then where you would say that what's happening is a kind of pacey urbanization. And you could put in there particularly China, Southeast Asia, the Middle East, where you've got really rapid urbanization going on. And the return to offices and public transport is well beyond where it was pre-COVID, right? So in Dubai, it's 110%. In, in Saudi, it's 105%. Um, and of course, in the region that is the Middle East, you, the Abraham Accords and other initiatives are creating much more of a sense of a stable, urbanizing, innovation-rich economy with um, Israel, UAE, and Saudi before too long having a much stronger set of relationships. So you're getting a very settled kind of urban system in the Middle East with Tel Aviv and Dubai and Abu Dhabi and Riyadh becoming part of a kind of a network. So that's very interesting. Something similar is happening in ASEAN as well. And then we've got a third group, if you like, where you would say urbanization is picking up. And uh, you'd put in there India and Africa in particular. And uh, what you can see happening there, of course, is that the race is on to build the infrastructure that supports cities but also supports industrial economies and everything else. And you've got the beginnings of some of the sector mix that you need to have an advanced economy. So the point of all of this, Chris, is simply to say we should all remember that what's happening in North America is somehow paralleled in Northeast Asia and in Europe, but not precisely. And that what's happening in North America is more of an outlier than more of the same. 
And actually, what's happening in the rest of the world is very, very rapid urbanization in most countries. And that's good news, right, because the people in this room and the people in the networks that we're all in are the innovators in cities. So the market for urban innovation is vibrant, global, and growing. And so it's very important, I think, to remember that we're not just here learning how to solve the problems in the buildings that we're involved with or the cities where we live. We're part of a kind of innovation ecosystem for cities that has a global purpose. And of course, that's why we have conferences like this. Right. So as you think about these different tiers of urbanization, and I think yeah. most of the people here in the physical audience here in this room come yep. from Europe or the Americas or Southeast Asia, uh, developed advanced economies. Most of the audience that's been online comes from, right, I think we had the last tally, 48 different countries, 199 yep. different cities um, from outside Europe and the Americas. As we think about urban innovation, what do you think are some of the lessons that we can all take away over the last 36 hours? And are there anything for our virtual audience from outside the Americas or outside mm -hmm. of Europe um, that we should say that, hey, these are some things that they should try and avoid as they move into this new phase of urbanization that they're going into? God, it's a great question. Um, let's, um, let's, let's just frame it again like this. So if you remember my 1980-2080 framing, it's about 2090 when we get 10 billion people living in 10,000 cities. That's where the world is headed. So 10 billion people in 10,000 cities. Then we're at the point where we have really have reached peak urbanization. Nearly all of the regions of the countries I just spoke about come together then, and we're in this urbanized world, other things being equal, right? Resilience, climate change, and everything else. So what's required, in a sense, what's the lesson of how you get there? Well, of course, almost everything we've been discussing here that's to do with climate resilience and circularity becomes important everywhere. Everybody has to you know, do that. We have to decouple urbanization from carbon emissions, and we have to decouple urbanization from the biodiversity emergency as well. So we all have to learn that, and anyone who learns anything, and you know, we just heard an amazing lecture that focused on trees, right? We all have to learn those core lessons about reintegrating cities with nature. The second thing that's really, really clear everywhere is that the big innovations are around participation, belonging, identity, tackling inequality. This is even more true in that middle group where I was talked about pacey urbanization, where urbanization has the unintended effect of making the rich richer and the poor poorer, at least for a period of time, until you do what New York City did and what London did and everybody, and you build public transport systems and public education and public health and public housing. And, this is why, of course, Chris, there's been a bit of reaction against the 15-minute city idea. I mean, there's, there's two opponents to the 15-minute city. One is simply a, a right-wing perspective that says people who drive cars have the right to drive cars and don't right. take away their freedoms. But another version of it is a kind of urbanist um, alternative, which is to say, Actually, what we need in all of our cities if we're going to tackle inequality and we're going to improve the quality of life for people in the poorest quartile is that we need big metropolitan systems, transport, housing, health, education. And the risk with the 15-minute city perspective is it makes you think all solutions are local, which they're not. So you've got that idea. Now, let me just come back to your question for one more comment. There's a huge range of innovations already going on in the fast urbanizing part of the world. And you only have to listen to what Mayor Claudia Lopez says, for example, about what they're doing around women's work and supporting women in the labor force. And you've only to remember what the original bus rapid transits were, what were the original initiatives around recycling and, uh, and, and the kind of the exchange economy to know that most of the urban innovations are not necessarily generated in the rich cities. They're generated in poorer cities too, and I think being aware of those uh, are key. So all I would say, 10 billion people living in 10,000 cities by 2085, 86, that's the framework for an urban innovation agenda that all of us can participate in. 
because it's not really about how those 10,000 cities compete and win against each other. It's about how those cities learn from each other and adopt the best practices. That's very important. And what don't you think in those cities that are ramping up in your third group yeah. that the urban innovation required will be quite different in order to meet that number of 10,000 cities, 10 billion people? Yeah. And we won't be able to get there in the same way that we've built our cities in terms of what we've done in the past is not going to work at that scale, at that speed, and decarbonize and enhance biodiversity at the same time. Is it realistic that we can ramp up and get to those numbers? Or what kinds of innovations or approaches will they need to do differently than yeah. the way we've done in the past? Well, in a minute, I'd just like to say something about the Amazon, because that kind of falls into this. But um, clearly, we're not going to build cities in Africa and India the way we've built cities in Europe and North America and Northeast Asia. That's definitely not going to happen. There's a big technology shift going on whereby we're going, you know, bypassing the whole idea of physical stores. Uh, I think it will, will, will be really key. Focusing much more on people's individual experience of where they live. Creating cities that have localness as well as metropolitanness. Um, much more use of interim and temporary forms of buildings, much more flexibility and agility. I mean, we see this, of course, happening in London and New York and all the other mature cities that are here. We're building now for flexibility rather than building for permanence. And if you like, the permanence is in the natural resources. The flexibility is in the built environment. We're going to see a lot more of that. We're also going to see, I think, much more uh, rapid adoption of, of more flexible and circular kinds of construction, as well as flexible and circular kinds of mobility. And you, you see this already. If you go to African cities, I spent quite a bit of time recently in five or six African cities and have particularly spent uh, a lot of time in, in, in Kigali. You know, the, the challenges that are going on there uh, are such that really flexible but durable interim solutions are constantly being invented. So we end up with, a, with cities that don't have the same fixed nature as the ones we're used to, but, but are much better at, as it were, recycling themselves. Um, let me just say something about the Amazon, because this has been a kind of an interesting part of my work for the last six months. Um, some of you will be aware that, you know, the, the sort of global agenda about the Amazon is that the Amazon is the lungs of the world, and that we, we rely upon uh, Brazil and Peru and Colombia and uh, Bolivia and uh, Ecuador and the other countries in the basin. We rely on them to protect the rainforest so that the world can breathe. That's the kind of story that you'll read in the New York Times or The Guardian or, or any other sort of uh, liberal Western uh, newspaper. But the, the problem with this story is that actually there's a huge number of people who live in the Amazon, and it's my, it's my usual question to people now to say, how many people live in the Amazon? And I don't know if anybody in the room knows the answer, but it's 47 million people who live in the Amazon, right? And those 47 million people live in 24 cities, and they live in about another 100 towns. And part of the problem is that those 24 cities and those 100 towns uh, are very informal. Um, uh, they have low institutional capability. They haven't been able to really build their bioeconomy, their ecotourism, and everything else. And as a result, the motivation for the people who live in the Amazon to participate in activities that contribute to deforestation is actually very, very high. So I'm involved in a very interesting project that's being led by the Inter-American Development Bank as part of the uh, Amazon Forever program, which is to think about how we could create sustainable urbanization in the Amazon in order to create better cities and towns with more diverse sources of health, housing, education, and jobs so that people have a different set of life choices. So rather than choosing to participate in activities that lead to deforestation, they'd actually have choices that would give them a better quality of life. That's the kind of urban innovation I think we're seeing much more in the developing world. Yeah. Well, I think it's exciting to think about in the future at World City of bringing some of these examples of urban innovation happening in completely mm -hmm. different ways at different scales and different parts of the world to the stage. Hopefully we can do that next year. Uh, what's your take on events like this and gatherings? You've been at all these you know, different uh, people coming back together post-COVID. What's the value from your perspective in this sort of cross-pollination and 
events like these? Well, uh, Chris, I think it's hugely valuable, and not, this is not just to flatter yourself and your colleagues to say that, you know, World City is a great thing and we need it, but you've got to think of it from the point of view of um, innovation economics. I think people in the room know about this, that in sectors that are relatively new or nascent or have high levels of R&D and change in them, and I would say broadly, you know, the urban services sector, if we can use that language, is A, one of the fastest growing sectors in the world for all the reasons I said, the, the century of the city, but B, it's a sector where innovations happen bottom up as well as top down, and very frequently the bottom up innovations, whether it's pedestrianization or whether it's underground railways or whether it's public hospitals, these bottom up innovations are very, very important. So we know that if you're gonna optimize innovation, convening is critical. You have to convene people who are in ecosystems so that they can learn from each other about each other's innovations, what we've been doing for the past 36 hours here, it seems to me, and then share them with a wider audience. And it gets shared digitally with the four people in the 48 nations who are watching us online. So we should all think of ourselves as participating in urban laboratories. We're all doing experiments. We should all be anxious to share the lessons from our experiments, the successes and the failures, and what we learn from the failures, and see ourselves as innovators in the urban future that's going to create the planet of 10 billion people living in 10,000 cities. And that's what this event is for, and that's what the other events that I've been lucky to attend in the last six months are all about. It's about finding a fast way to share innovations amongst people who have some kind of common purpose and creating content that is compelling, as well as, of course, creating social networks for the people who are here and creating an experience of the city itself. You know, people have had a, an experience of being in New York, uh, being here this week, and that itself is kind of enriching to everybody, and it, I think it gives people inspiration and motivation, and hopefully they go home with batteries recharged. So I think it's very important, and you've got to keep going, Chris. All right. Well, thanks, Greg. I think that's a, a great final word. Everyone, give me a warm round of applause for Greg being here. Uh, and I think encourage everyone to check out Greg's sessions online, some, some great conversations. Greg, stay put for a minute. I have a few closing words of myself that you know, I have to share with everyone, and that is, first of all, you know, gratitude to all of you for being here uh, in person, and even more so to all of you that have joined online. It's quite a different experience online. Better in some ways, missing out in some, in some parts, uh, but uh, really astonishing to have people from 50 different countries, 199 cities. I couldn't get that 200th city but uh, somebody will log on later on and we'll get over 200. Uh, but we had also wanted to thank all of our remarkable speakers, uh, but in particular, thanking all of the sponsors who, with their support, are, were able to make this content free and available to all of these people around the world, not just live over the yesterday and today, uh, but on demand for the next month, and we'll see many people come into the platform and download these talks um, as we go. For those of you that are here, if you signed up for tours tomorrow, you should be getting emails or have already received an email with some of the directions um, in your inbox. If you haven't signed up for a tour and would like to, uh, please see our front desk on the way out. And most of all, I'd like to thank everyone from Resonance and the World City team for uh, putting this together and making us all look good up here on the stage and the Time Center and their team as well. We're gonna be getting together later on this evening. Uh, if you wanna meet Jeff Speck in the bar across the street, He's there and getting uh, libations going already. Um, and we're going to be meeting between at uh, the Garrett, if you want to join us, between 7 and 10 for a little World City after dark. Thanks so much, everyone, for being here. It's a real pleasure. And I look forward to seeing you out there in the city later on. <laughs>